Today we're continuing our discussion of some of the art movements surrounding World War I. And just so you know, I've written out a transcript for myself. So if you see me looking over to the side, I'm looking at the text that I've written for myself, um, just to kind of keep myself on task here. So last time we were looking at some of the avant-garde art movements that developed during and immediately following World War I, the utopian movements of De Steele, the Bauhaus, and the Soviet avant-garde. Besides these utopian examples, World War I evoked some other, let's say, interesting and more nihilistic responses. You might recall from a few weeks ago that the Italian futurists were really excited for war because they thought it would create a kind of tabula rasa or clean slate for a new modern world. This idea of a clean slate also provided a launching point for the Dada movement. which was an international movement that began in Zurich, Switzerland in 1916. Now keep in mind that Switzerland was neutral during the war, so it was a safe place for radical art to develop and grow. And indeed, most of the artists involved were anti-war pacifists. Uh, the term Dada means hobby horse in French. Yes, yes, in Russian. And it kind of represents baby talk in multiple languages like English, of course, but also German. So it's an international word, and it's also kind of a nonsense word. And that gives us an idea of the kind of nonsensical nature of Dada. In fact, Dada is often referred to as an anti-art movement, but mostly as an anti-commercial art movement. That's part of the reason that they often used performance and found objects to create art that could not be commodified. Hugo Ball's performance of this sound poem, Caruana, exemplifies this. The performance occurred in 1916, and it's known only by photographs and reproductions of his poem. Written in a nonsense language, it was meant to do away with any sense of logic or reason, which was responsible for creating machine guns, tanks, bombs, and other devices to more efficiently kill millions of people in a devastating war. If reason and logic brought us to the point of world war, then maybe that's not such a good way to go. This collage also fully embodies Dada's nonsensical new kind of art. According to his contemporaries, Jean Arp actually tore up pieces of paper into little pieces and let them fall to the floor and then pasted those scraps where they happened to land. Rather than ordering the page according to his own design, he just let all control go and let gravity and randomness kind of take over. So the result is no story, no picture, just torn paper as it fell to the floor. Remember Duchamp from a few weeks ago? He was originally from Paris, but he moved to New York in 1915 during the war. He moved back to France after the war ended, but in the meantime, he made a huge impact on the avant-garde art scene in New York. His fountain is an example of what Duchamp called a ready-made, which is a term that describes prefabricated, often mass-produced objects isolated from their intended use and elevated to the status of art by the artist choosing and designating them as such. So in this case, he actually bought a urinal from the store. He signed it with a pen name, R. Mutt, and dated it 1917. Then he put it on a pedestal. It's this combination of both high art, because he's bringing it into a gallery space, as well as low, because he's using a urinal, and it's a found object too. Is it immoral? Is it vulgar? Because it's mass produced, it means that it's not made by the artist's own hands. So that takes away any sense of skill or originality, things that we normally associate with art. Behind it is instead the importance of artistic choice. The idea that what rules the art is not the technical skill, but the concept or the idea. That's what was implied by Duchamp's reading due this week, the Richard Mutt case, where he argues that it doesn't matter that he didn't make the urinal with his own hands. What matters is that he chose it. This brings up the question of authorship. Who's the artist? 
This would become absolutely central to art later in the 20th century, as we'll see. People often wonder where the name R. Mutt comes from. Could it be Mutt and Jeff, a popular comic strip at the time, or maybe Mott's Plumbing Company, which made toilets? Uh, they were located in New York, so that would have made sense as well. But in recent years, um, new scholarship has come to light and shows evidence that Duchamp wasn't even responsible for the piece. It was actually this eccentric woman that you see on the left here, the Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven. She had previously created another sculpture, also originally attributed to a male artist on the right here, made of a pipe, and Duchamp himself had talked about the piece as being her idea. So attribution is tricky, especially when artists are appropriating pre-existing imagery and using found objects. This is an example of an assisted ready-made. In other words, taking a found object, in this case, a found image, and changing it in some way. There's no more traditions of Western art. This is art that questions and upends all of those traditions. It's art that's almost anti-art again. It's irreverent, it's sly, it's funny. It removes the notion of skill or aesthetics. And Duchamp used to say that he was against quote unquote retinal art. In other words, art that's just for your eyes. And he promoted instead art as an idea. Uh, so here on the right, we're looking at a piece by Duchamp called L. H-O-O-Q. It's from 1919. And again, it's an assisted ready-made because he took a postcard of the Mona Lisa and then he made a few small adjustments to it. So you can see he put a little mustache and goatee on her and he wrote the letters L-H-O-O-Q at the bottom of the image. So what does that mean? Well, the letters, if you read them out loud in French, sounds like this. L H O O Q. Now, if you were to say that kind of quickly, it sounds like you would be saying L H O O Q, maybe. Pardon my French, by the way. Um, and L H O O Q in French means she has a hot ass. So he's playing with words a little bit here and also being irreverent and um, kind of poking fun at the traditions of art history. Both the fountain and Elasho Oku then combine high and low, are immoral or vulgar perhaps, are mass produced, and are not made with the artist's own hands for the most part. In other words, they're kind of like plagiarized or appropriated in a sense. They highlight nonsense and absurdity in the face of a nonsense and absurd war. The Berlin Dadaists were definitely more political than the other Dada artists that we looked at so far. You may have gotten a sense of this from one of the readings we had for this week by Richard Hilsenbeck and Raoul Hausmann. Um, the essay which was called, What is Dadaism and What Does It Want in Germany? The Dada in Berlin coincided with the establishment of the new Weimar period, which we kind of talked about a little bit a few weeks ago um, when we looked at the Bauhaus. So it's on the, it's an unstable time, politically speaking. Um, here we're looking at a work by Hannah Huck with an incredibly long title. It's called Cut with the Kitchen Knife Dada Through the Last Weimar Beer Belly Cultural Epoch of Germany. Here we see a fairly new medium, which is photo montage. No more oil on canvas, which is traditional. Instead, it's a cut up art form to reflect a fractured world. It's a sharp critique of the bourgeois forces that led Europe to World War I. It's a critique of gender roles and a celebration of Dada all rolled into one. Today, this artwork is well known and Huck is a well-respected artist. But at the time, the Berlin Dadaists referred to her as the girl who fetched us sandwiches, beer, and coffee.